Sometimes, what? He said bye. Bye, have fun with Grandma. Have fun with Grandma in the back. Sometimes I struggle with a Sunday night message, uh, what to preach. Uh, I mean, I come in here and preach John 3.16, and it's all a bunch of Christian people, amen, and you would be like, so I need to teach teach from the Word of God and give you some, give you a blessing. And so, uh, Lord, I struggle with that, and I, I really work hard to try to find something that would be uh, interesting, something you might not have heard before. Uh, something, uh, a nugget from the Word of God. Uh, so let's return back to the old story. Go to the book of Acts tonight. The book of Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at uh, uh, the first martyr in the Bible, Stephen. Amen. Stephen, the first, first martyr in the Bible. Chapter 6, verse 7, and I'd like to preach a message entitled, Faith Isn't Cheap. Faith Isn't Cheap. And I think, I think uh, you grew up in the United States of America, and, and in my age group, I mean, in maybe Charles' age group, and maybe, you know, from the 60 to 80 group that were still here. Back in the day, I mean, it was just, everybody went to church, and it was a thing to do, and if you didn't go to church, you know, uh, you were the you were the outcast, and but things have changed, and we're we're catching up with the rest of the world, and the and the rest of the world, uh, you're likely to be stoned at the very least and lose your life at the very most, and uh, so we're just kind of I want to go over that tonight a little bit. Faith isn't cheap, and go back to the first martyr in the Bible, and then we'll move on from there. Acts chapter six, verse seven. Follow along with me. And we're going to read down to verse fifteen. And see what happened to Stephen. Amen. 6, verse 6. No, verse 7, yes. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. It made them mad. Go ahead and make the religious crowd mad. and you got a mess on your hands. And Stephen, full of faith and power, the great wonders and miracles among the people. And there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Oh, wow. He was anointed of God, folks. This, this man really spoke the word. Then they suborned Men. Now, I looked that word up, suborn. It's an old English word, and it means to trick as in perjury, as in lie, as in get people to lie about him and go against him and, and uh, make stories up. That's what that means. So they suborned men, which said, in other words, are lying, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. I set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth, ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Stephen was pure as the white driven snow. He was a good, he was a solid man of God, but he was coming up against the first group that the devil has raised up now in the Bible to kill this first man of God, the first martyr in the Bible. Faith isn't cheap. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here again tonight. Well, I pray that I'll be a blessing to the folks that have come out, and, <clears throat> and we thank you for all you do for us. And, for the young boys in the back, and for Dustin and him, his uh, willingness to uh, jump in and uh, become our youth director, and and all the different changes and all the different people that are coming forward to do things in the church, and 
We're excited about this new year and what God's going to do. Pray all these things, Lord, and just bless this message tonight. It'll be a blessing to all that have gathered here. That it'll be a learning time as we learn about people around the world that are dying for being Christian, just believing in the Lord. Lord, let us never take that for granted, even though we live in the United States of America. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me give you a fact that you need to know. In this story, Stephen is going to die for his faith in Jesus Christ. These nice, refined, professional Jewish leaders and priests are going to cover their ears with their hands, mob Stephen, drag him through the streets of Jerusalem to a point outside the city, and pummel him with stones until he's dead. With that fact in mind, I want to establish the relevancy of this text. I want to show you that this text deals with a vital issue, what's going on in our world today. I begin our study tonight with Philip, a young Christian in West Bengal, India. Philip lives in a largely Buddhist region of India. He's been raised to be a devout follower of the Buddhist religion. He has never considered any other faith until his brother Kancha believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior and began to witness to his brother. Soon Kancha was holding Bible studies. He was urging others to listen to the message of Christ and turn from their vain trust in Buddha to faith in the one who had died for their sins and risen from the dead for their salvation. And in time, Philip became a believer, but secretly, he didn't tell anyone of his faith in Christ for fear of persecution. Well, it came. A group of militant Buddhists stormed into the room where Kancha was leading a Bible study. Philip huddled in a corner as the men, knives in hand, ripped up songbooks, shredded every single Bible, smashed the guitar they used to accompany the singing. That was just as recent as 2004. Since then, Philip has gone public with his faith, but there has been a price to pay. He has been repeatedly attacked and beaten, called to preach. He has been prepared for ministry and leads Bible studies in many villages, and his reason is, the reason we preach and share is only because of the drastic change in our lives. We have received the truth, the life, and the joy. How can we be quiet? We want to give to others what Jesus gave to us. This is just one example. Let me take you back to August 15, 2002. And in that 24-hour period, you may have remembered on the news, it's been a little while ago, but Islamic terrorists in Indonesia raised to the ground the homes of Christians in five separate villages. Many of the Indonesian Christians were killed. This included children who were strangled to death and an elderly man who was shot 70 times with a AK-47, whatever you want to call it, just, just riddled with bullets. On August 2nd, 02, the Far East Broadcasting Corporation released a story detailing the persecution of Christians in Vietnam. Are you, are you, I mean, this is, this is amazing. Soldiers are entering the homes of Christians, and they're searching for Bibles and Christian literature, and if they find anything, the house is burnt, and the Christians are arrested, and often never seen again. If they find no Bibles, they look for idols or some other symbols of the local beliefs. If they don't find them, they find the families the equivalent of five months of pay for not having the local idols in their home. In 2007, the government distributed poisonous sugar cubes to Christian households in the Hmong region of Vietnam, killing a great number of people. As a result, many Christians have left their homes and fled to other areas of the country. Thus, the group of Vietnamese people that have come to America, I don't know if you know that, the Hmong. Have anybody ever seen the movie, the Clint Eastwood movie, El Camino? In that movie about the Vietnamese family, those were Hmong people from Vietnam. That's what we're talking about. Now, the worst of all was Saudi Arabia. It's the home of the sacred Muslim cities of Mecca and Medina. Medina. It is a crime to convert to Christianity, and the penalty for conversion can be death. 
That has made Saudi Arabia the leading country in the world for persecuting Christians for many years now. But in 2007, (laughs) North Korea was even worse. Its government had enacted policies aimed at purging North Korea of Christianity altogether. This year, thousands of Christians have been put to death in North Korea. Throughout the world, Christians are being tortured in prison and killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. Reports come to us of of Chinese Christians having molten metal poured over their heads. In Sudan, Christians who refuse to convert to Islam are being denied food and medicine. Many have been sold into slavery, sanctioned by the government. So what does that have to do with us? Let me quote the most recent book by John Piper. And he says, Brothers, we are not professionals. Insulated Western Christianity is waking up from the dream world that being a Christian is normal and safe. More and more, true Christianity is becoming what it was at the beginning in the Bible, in the book of Acts, foolish and dangerous. He follows this with two supporting scriptures in 1 Corinthians 1.23, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. In John 16.2, Yea, the time cometh, the whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. Now does that sound about like how it is? What about the Taliban? We didn't even mention the Taliban. We didn't even mention Iraq and Iran and, and Afghanistan and all that's going on over there. Don't be caught being a Christian there either. I want to remind you tonight that your Christianity may not have cost you anything, but it's cost a lot of people a lot all over the world. The salvation that God offers to us through Jesus Christ is free. But the faith that has brought it to you and to me that makes it available to the world is not cheap. From the beginning, and Stephen was the first, it has been paid for by the blood of the martyrs. Tonight we're going to speak about the martyrs, speaking with Stephen in the Bible, number one. And I want to speak to you about that. Number one, hatred for the message brought the death of the messenger. It's never about you. See, we have to remember that they don't hate you. They hate the message. It's the same in church, man. When people get upset, they get all uh, they get all twisted backwards. It's not me they're mad. They're mad at God, man. They, they just need to get right with God and quit jumping from church to church to church and taking your and folding up their problems in a suitcase and and taking them to the next church, and the next pastor has the same problem, only worse. Let's look back in our text in chapter 6, in verse 7, and we see that the word of God grew mightily and prevailed. With the number of disciples and followers of Jesus multiplied greatly. Many that once served in the temple left their serving and their sacrifices and became obedient, the Bible says, obedient into the faith, And the message of Jesus proclaimed by the apostles. They got right and they got saved. Then you go down to verses 9 and 10, and we learn the Jews of the synagogues from all over the Roman world debated Stephen on the things that he taught. He got them all stirred. Amen. They contested his claims. They argued their case about the scriptures. Stephen argued back with the scriptures, and they could not resist. The Bible says wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. The the Bible always wins, amen? Then in verses 11 and 13, we read, when they decided to stop the ministry of Stephen, they did not attack his character or the way he practiced his faith. Listen to me, it's important you get this tonight. They attacked the message. They always attack the message, amen? That's what they do. And the things that he spoke and said, they attacked by the witnesses that they had hired for, and the Bible says suborned, which means that they hired those people, they they hired them to lie, amen? So, how crucial is all this? Stephen was willing to die for the truth that he preached. He knew. He knew this wasn't going to go well. But he didn't care. He just did what he had to do. Amen. And the Jewish leaders were willing to kill. Can you imagine that? To kill. 
to silence it. I'm telling you, it's headed. It's not that way now in America, but it's headed that way. Oh, man. And it's, it is that way in other parts of the world. So number two, what did Stephen say that the Jews found so threatening? So I want to sum up the charges found in verses 13 and 14. Let's read that. And set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Stephen spoke words against this holy place. Now, what is that holy place? The temple. They still had the temple and the law, not the Ten Commandments. It's not what he's talking about. But all the laws associated. Oh, by the way, it's all the laws that the rabbis wrote. You know that, right? That the rabbis wrote a bunch of things, and they believe that to this very day. It does not appear in God's Word. It has nothing to do with God. It has all to do with religious rituals and ritualisms and legalism and just a bunch of man-made stuff. Amen? Just ask a Brother uh, Savalowski sometime. They claim to have heard Stephen say that Jesus would destroy the temple and change the customs. Again, all the things that were so important to them and their worship. I mean, this is, I mean, this is who they were, man. Listen, if they're going to put you out of a job, you're going to be a little upset, man. These, these guys were all getting rich off the temple. These were all the Bloombergs of the world, amen? I mean, the, the, <laughs> these were the rich dudes, and they were getting rich off of all the poor people, folks. Poor people. Isn't that sad? That is so sad. So, did Stephen really say this? And if so, was it true? Well, did Jesus destroy the temple and replace it with customs? Is that what the Bible teaches? In John chapter 2, the Jews asked for a sign from Jesus that would authenticate his ministry. In response, Jesus said this. Remember, this is a very famous quote that went with him all the way through, all the way until his trial with Pontius Pilate. He said this, Destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Now, they were thinking of brick and mortar, right? They're thinking of uh, the, the building and all the, the big temple. Oh, Jesus, that wasn't what Jesus was speaking of, was it? No, not at all. The Jews were shocked. They, they're gonna, he's going to do what? He's going to destroy our temple? They said back, 40 and 6 years was this temple and building. Wilt thou rear it up in three days? And John comments, but he spoke of the temple of his body. It's likely that Jesus said on one or more occasion, because at his trial his accusers said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it up in three days. And they kept bringing it up. And they brought it up at the, the kangaroo court trial, the all-night trial with, with the Sanhedrin and all that junk that went on before he got crucified. When asked if he said this, Jesus said nothing. Remember? He said nothing. Finally, well, he hung on the cross. We are told that the crowds taunted him with these words. Remember this? Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. They never got it. They never, they never understood what he was talking about. Now think about it. The devil and all his angels are dancing. They're just having the, the biggest party in the history of mankind. The Lord God's Son from heaven is going to die. Think about, what they're, they're just, the devil himself thinks he's won the battle and the war. And Jesus already announced to them what he's going to do. In three days, <laughs> I will raise it up. But see, when Stephen preached this message, they still didn't understand what was going on, amen? So when Jesus referred to himself as the temple 
He knew that this is the he knew this is what was going to happen. That his command would be associated with the brick and mortar temple and all the things that happened there as part of their religion. So why did he say it? Because he's Jesus. And he knew that these people were just out there. But because more than that, because he knew that when he died, his purpose for the temple will be fulfilled. Now stay with me on this thought. The salvation that all its sacrifices pointed to, what, that what would be provided, in essence, when Jesus died, the temple died with him. Now, before you say amen, let me explain that. That is why when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was split in two. It was a token of the coming destruction of all of what they believed in. It was done. It was over. History, toast. But they, see, but the building was still there. And so they did not get it yet. The temple was coming down and everything linked to it. Number one, the priesthood. Because Jesus is our great priesthood, priest. He is the only mediator between God and man. They were going to be out of a job. The priesthood was going to be wiped out. Because Jesus has entered into heaven, <clears throat> itself on our behalf, now to appeal the presence of God. Now, take your Bibles, if you will. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. This is the real thing that he was talking about, that he would raise the temple up in three days. In Hebrews 9, and by the way, we're doing a study on Hebrews on Wednesday night. We're going to get here. This is just such great, great stuff in Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. He's not talking about the temple on earth which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. They just didn't understand, did they? The priesthood was going to, and now the second thing that was going to go away, if you stay with me on this thought, is the sacrifice. And they, they, and they were, I mean, they lived and died by these sacrifices. And because we are sanctified by the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, if you want to just turn the page if you're still there, in Hebrews 10.10 10, it tells us that that sacrificial system will be gone too. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. We don't have to keep sacrificing more animals and more and more and more and more and more. We don't have to keep getting saved over and over and over and over and over again because he died once for all, it says. In Hebrews 9, 12, it's because he, by his own blood, obtained eternal redemption for us in Hebrews 9, 12. So the priesthood, the sacrifices will be gone. And thirdly, the physical brick and mortar temple, where is it? Is it? Does anybody know where the temple is today? We don't even know exactly where, they're gonna, where it was built back in the day. I mean, they got an idea, but there's all kinds of arguments. It's going to be over here. It's going to be over here. It's going to be where the, 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 the Muslim thing is, amen, the, the great big mosque that's built on the, on the temple mount. They're all arguing about it. But it's going to be gone too, right? In Matthew chapter 24, we read that the disciples went out to show Jesus the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Did you think that did, did Jesus' words come true? Is there, is there anything left of, you know what's left? A wall. All they have is a wall. Now, 
because we're not Jew, Jewish, we get it wrong. We always call it the Wailing Wall. That's what I've been taught all my life. The wailing. Bill tells me that if you go over there and say that to them, they get real offended. They call it the Western Wall. <laughs> you can do what you want, amen. So that's what the Jewish people call it, the Western Wall. Now, it gets even better in Revelation chapter 21. As John describes the new heaven, he wrote this. And I saw no temple therein. He's up in heaven now, in the new heaven. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Listen to me. He is the temple. I believe these are the kinds of things in the Bible, way back in our text, in Acts chapter 6, way back where we started, these are the things that Stephen was preaching. Is it any wonder that they wanted to kill him? They're going to lose everything that they stood for, everything that they believe in. They teach you in soul winning, here, right here in, 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 uh, in wherever you are in the United States of America. About soul winning. Don't ever put down a man's religion. Just kind of get on the same wavelength and can find out where he's at and then steer him to the right way to the Lord. Here's Stephen. He just, he just flat out told him, you guys are a bunch of lunatics. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, the temple is, is no more. See, now we know why they killed him. They just, they just didn't want to hear him anymore, amen? He taught that Jesus would destroy the temple because Jesus took the place of it. They didn't want to hear that. You know that people don't want to hear that today? They don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way. You understand that they don't even know that Jesus is the Son of God. Hey, you go talk to a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus isn't even the Son of God. I said, what do you do with that verse? I was there one day at work. All these, I, work, I used to work with a company. 60% of the company was Jehovah Witness. I mean, we had it out all the time. I tried never to argue with them. They, they, would, never, they would never give in, and they, they never gave up, and they would just argue with you until they're blue in the face. It really, really wasn't worth the trouble. One day I said, what do you do with that verse? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And he just looked at me. <laughs> huh? You never heard that verse? You never heard that verse in the Bible before? They don't know, folks. They, and when they hear it for the first time, it absolutely blows their mind. They get mad. Remember now, they don't get mad at you. They get mad at the message. He is our priest. He is our sacrifice. He is the temple in which God and man meet in heaven. He's talking about it this morning. Uh, how do we get to God? Well, who is the mediator? He was saying, well, it's the, some people say, well, it's the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and gets us and speaks to Jesus. But now, Jesus is the one that speaks to God. He is the the Bible says he is the great mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. By the way, it calls him the man Christ Jesus. There, there were two results on this day of what happened that day when he preached. A, a great number of priests were converted. Remember that? When they first started out, I mean, things were going well. A bunch of, think about it. But think about it. A bunch of Catholic priests all gathered around and we got them saved. I'm saying, you know, and send them back to their Catholic church, say, preaching the gospel in a Catholic church. Man, they would, man, I mean, that would, not, uh, they would be thrown, I mean, they would get rid of them, amen. I mean, there was a big thing he just read the other day that they can't get enough priests, and so uh, they came up with this new rule that the priest can get married. Well, the, the crazy nut in Rome went over there and he said, no, 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 you have to be single. We don't care. Why? 
Where in the Bible says that the pastor has to be single? Matter of fact, you should be married. Keep you out of a lot of trouble. Amen? All right. All right, then we're not going to get on that one. But a great number of priests were converted that day by the truth, and they became obedient to the faith in our story. But then the religious crowd got stirred up and began to dispute with Stephen concerning the truth, and they couldn't get him on the merits of the truth of the argument. So they killed him. Do you understand that's why they killed him? They saw as the only way, you know there's people that think that there's only way they can get Trump out is to kill him. I know they're not saying that publicly. Think about all the crazy stuff that's going on in our country right now. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to say, uh, well, you know, the, the devil didn't do it. The Russians did. <laughs> We're start, I mean, it's just stupid stuff, right? Amen. They just thought the only way they could win was to kill him. True Christians don't kill because the Mormons disagree with us. Do we go out and kill them? Because, it, But, boy, the Muslims do. I just read something just the other day that one of the squad, you know what the squad is, don't you? Those four women in the Congress that are all pretty nutso, and they believe in the, I don't know, they believe in all kinds of some really weird stuff. Well, they had the one woman from Michigan from the Islamic community up there in uh, Dearborn, uh, I forget her name, Talib, something Talib, and she was uh, being, they quoted her that said, well, we had, we had just have to, if, if we convert everybody in the country and we're going to convert them all to the Muslim faith, and if they don't convert, we'll kill them. Folks, this is what we're, this is where we're at. This is where we're at. And, and they're going to start, go ahead and put something out on our front sign about, I'll tell Ryan, go ahead, Ryan, uh, put something out there and tell them that homosexuality is a sin and it'll take you straight to hell. Put that on the front sign. How long do you think it is before they destroy our property, break our windows? I'm telling you, we're there. We're there. You can't even do that. One time, Brian Brewer up in Michigan years and years ago, and this is 20 years, 20-some 20 years ago, uh, on his own, <laughs> went out the front sign at Faith Baptist Church, big, big, huge church, 1,000 people. Independent Fundamental Baptist in Michigan, uh, and he put on the sign, turn or burn. <laughs> the church phone rang off the hook, and they threatened to, to uh, destroy the property and kill the pastor. And the pastor came down and looked him up, wanted to know who put that on the sign. Get it off there now. That's the kind of thing we should be proud of. Turn or burn. We've reached the, we, we've, this is, we live in different times. It, listen, we are in the age of the Laodicean church. People don't want to stand up and preach what is right. They don't want to stand up for the truth of the word of God anymore. They just want to water it down and be happy-go-lucky as long as we get a good offering on Sunday. And I love a good offering, amen. I mean, praise to God, I love a good offering. But listen, if it's going to be that you're going to destroy my church and mess me up, I want you gone. I mean, I, I mean, this is the way it is, man. I'm telling you. Listen, we got we got to stand up for the what's right and true, and God will bless that. And that's true. True Christians don't kill for these things, but many have died over the years. Do you know that that book that you hold in your hand? Have you, read, have you read the history of that book in your hand that people want to throw away, the King James Bible? Go back and read the history of all the men that have died for just printing words on a paper that have put down and became what we now know as the King James Bible. And yet, we just, oh, well, we just have a better one and it sounds better. And no, 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 no. 
It is the one that God gave us. Tonight, it's my prayer that we stand up for what's right, just as Stephen did in the Bible. Unfortunately, he will go down in history as the first martyr in the Bible, and he died. And just remember now, think about this one for a moment. All that's going on, and we and it sounded so terrible that he died, but remember who stood in the background and the, held, held the coats and watched it happen? Who was that? And clipped his heart and changed him forever? Eventually on that road to Damascus? God still does big things in ways that we don't understand. What if Michelle Jones fell down the stairs and hurt herself pretty bad so that they could alleviate her seizures and she hit just on the very same spot on her head where she was having the same trouble with her seizures and the doctor said, you know, one of two things could happen. Her seizures could get worse or they could go away. So they had no cure for it at the time. So let's pray that. Could God have done that, <laughs> allowed that to happen to help a, a, a faithful servant of God? You don't think that God does things like that? And he's a big God. He does things on our behalf that many times look terrible. Rough, bad, but yet down the road, because we, we don't see the end of the story. We never get to see the other side until we get to heaven. Then we'll see the whole story, and then we'll, oh, you did that for, the, oh, oh, and how we reacted or didn't react. We got a blessing or missed out on a blessing. Let's all be like Stephen. Stand up for what's true and right all over or where we're at. On the job, in your community, your neighbors. I've been getting a kick out of going next door and just uh, just inviting my neighbor to church every time I get a chance. And you know you're welcome to come to church. You know I'm, I'm the pastor there. You know I'd love for you to come. And he goes, yeah, I know, I know, pastor. I, he calls me Bill, but. I, I know, and we know we, we were going to come. <laughs> I'm going to keep inviting them, that's for sure. Last time you invited somebody to church, last time you told somebody about the Lord Jesus Christ, listen, it's going to, co it's going to start costing us something, man. You might as well get busy right now while you still can when it's not as, not as terrible right now. Get a whole stack of tracks. Take one, by the way. I want rid of the tracks that are on that table out there. Take them all with you tonight. They got the old website on them. I got a box of 3,000 tracks in my office that has the brand new website on them. But I can't put them out until you, you take the old one with you. Now, the old website directs you to the new website for just one year. So it's still good. So it'll go to us. So take them tonight. They're out there on the table. Take them all. Fill your pockets full. Fill your purses full. Give them to everybody. Leave them, in, leave them in the airport. Leave them in the bathrooms. Put them in the toilet paper. I'm not, I am not kidding you, man. Where do you do the most reading? Yes, in the bathroom. Oh, yeah. I mean, years ago, you used to take the newspaper. Now we just take our phone. Because our phone is the newspaper. Change. Still. Do a lot of reading on the toilet. They find those tracks. They do. They really do. Get them with you tonight. Let's be more like Stephen. Stand up. Stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever we go. This is God's people here tonight, and I know it is. Uh, we have a hymn of invitation, but if, if you just want to come and pray tonight, Amen. If you just want to come to an altar and pray, and pray for family, pray for people, pray for pray for this church, and we're going through lots of changes this year. We're trying to get some things rolling again. Hey, listen, we want to see people saved right here. 
You know what's wrong with churches today? We all go to church and have fun and eat dinner, but we don't get nobody saved anymore. Whatever happened, whatever happened to people getting saved in church, that's a novel idea. Isn't that what we used to do when we were kids and went to church and people would walk down the aisle and, and the preacher would meet them up there and then he'd say, well, I want to introduce you to so-and-so and they just got saved today. But when's the last time you went to church and you saw that really happen? Well, some of these things we're doing, we want to do that. Amen? Can't get the adults, we'll get the kids. Can't get the adults baptized, we'll baptize 20 kids. I'm telling you, that's what happens when you have a good bus ministry. You get them saved. They don't forget. They might get out of the wheel for a while, but listen, it, it's good. It's good stuff. You'll fall in love with some people that need the Lord. Amen. I mean, Dustin just jumped in with the youth. Man, he's already having a blast back here. I can't even get him to come in here anymore. He just hangs out with the kids back here all the time. He's, I mean, he's having a blast. I've never seen nothing like it. It's great. I told him, I said, Dustin, this is your church. This is what the church God's and he's training you, and one day you'll be a pastor. And uh, this, is, this is how God's going to train you. Amen. Fall in love with me. He told me this morning, he said, now I understand, Pastor, when you say, I love my people. I love, I love what I'm doing. Let's all stand tonight. Jesus paid it all. 295, he really did, amen. He is the temple, amen. And he did raise it up in three days. But they never got it. And when he preached it, they killed him. Wow, what a story. Jesus paid it all. If you need to come and just pray tonight, man, I'm telling you, we got lots to pray about. I just need to come and pray, and maybe you don't—you can't even get on a knee anymore. If we're old and crippled, that's okay. Come and sit on the front pew if you want to. That's all right. Just come and show your love of God. Two ninety-five. Whatever the Lord would have you to do. You know, there's God's people that are here tonight. Amen. Number two ninety-five. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.